Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSPs. This is the Ukraine War News Update for the third Friday the 13th. Oh my goodness, let all your suspicions run awry and believe in crazy stuff. Anyway, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, this is the first of, I'm sure, many videos you know me. We're going to start with the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before, all the usual caveat supply. Of course, 1,220 personnel lost is, uh, at, as we've seen over the last, I don't know how, <laughs> months and months and months since Kharkiv really was attacked. We are seeing considerable losses for the Russians. This is at the level we've seen for the last few days. There have been over 1,300 in a couple of days, then as low as 1,000, but it's, it's there or thereabouts, incredibly high number. 18 tanks is about double the daily average. It's a huge number lost, so something must be going on because 48 troop carrying FBs is a massive uptick as well. Both of those numbers suggest, and put that together with pretty high personnel numbers, that the Russians are attacking in a number of places and could well be losing uh, a bunch of equipment. I, I would suggest probably in the counter-attack up in Kursk, but I could be wrong. It might also be activity taking place in Pokrovsk or down near Vukhladar. Who knows? Uh, but certainly some much higher losses in categories that have really downpicked over the last week or so. Uh, artillery systems 52 another heavy day there was yesterday almost a record day for artillery system losses uh, 52 is a massive number there one artillery uh, sorry one multiple launch rocket system and then 79 vehicles and fuel tanks huge losses in that category as well and 10 pieces of special equipment so th this is a bad day at the office for the russians definitely uh, so i suggest that they, they are probably on the attack now, Andrew Perpetua's loss lists, uh, of course, there'll be a lag between when these are claimed. So this will be the stuff that's happened yesterday. And then the, the there's a lag time or lead time until you see that evidence, if you do indeed see it, uh, turning up on the socials. So Andrew looking at socials, this would be from yesterday. So activity probably from two to three days ago is the reality of it. And here we see uh, Ukrainians and, well, Russians having a few more combat losses than Ukrainians there, but generally um, almost parity. Russians losing more in terms of civilian equipment um, there, including, yeah, some unknown kit that just can't tell what it was. It's so fundamentally blown up, one would have thought. Right, let's look at Ukrainian losses. We have um, not too much of concern for the Ukrainians. The normal uh, losses that you would expect as they attack. So a couple of tanks, a few Bradleys that have been abandoned there. Um, some uh, APCs, Humvees. We've got MRATs, Max Pro, Kirpy and so on, almost all of their combat assets have been abandoned or destroyed. So that's not great, although it's not too many bits of kit, so it's easy to skew that data. But yeah, a lot of destroyed and abandoned um, in their whole loss list there. So when we go to the Russians, actually looking slightly better in terms of damage as opposed to destroyed or abandoned. A captured tank, so they have lost the T-72 to the Ukrainians there. But we go right to the top. A Su-30SM destroyed. There's enough evidence suggested uh, that Andrew has added that to his loss list, and that's obviously $50 million of kit. Uh, other notes, he says boat, man pad, boat pad, Position on map is an estimate, so that's where he's geolocated it. Interesting that the crane was a man pad, and I was wondering whether that was from a man pad on a rig, a man pad on a boat with people in it, or a man pad attached to a Vigura V5 drone is also potentially the case, because we have seen some of these USVs, unmanned surface vehicles, uh, adapted with uh, these man pad firers. Um, yeah. So anyway, artillery, oh no, the engineering vehicle, but this is more than engineering vehicles, them led the delay, something like that. Anyway, that's the, throws out mines, and it's fairly rare, and they do potentially cause an awful lot of an issue to the Ukrainians, because they can drive and project, drive down a track and project 
you know, thousands of mines into the fields at quite some distance. So destroying that is really useful. We see, we see I showed you that video on the Frontline update, or at least I referenced it last night. Uh, some artillery systems there. We, as mentioned, captured tank, a few other tanks, and not too many. Uh, four tanks, three of them damaged, one captured. Infantry fighting vehicles, majority of them abandoned or destroyed, but not a crazy proportion there. BPM... Uh, BMP, sorry, ones, twos, and threes, BTR as well, uh, and then an APC destroyed, a bunch of trucks damaged, uh, a host of civilian vehicles and ATVs just mainly destroyed. Um, but uh, yes, nothing crazy apart from that plane, and that plane is a is a big loss to the Russians, of course. Now, Tim White says regarding the increase of manpower losses. So this was, although I said it's there or thereabouts, there were two days of over 1,300. And actually, we've seen it at the upper end of the scale of, I keep talking about sort of 1,000 to 1,300. It's been the range that we've seen for the last sort of, six months, which is insanely high. It used to be getting over 1,000 was massive. Now, getting over 1,300 is massive. And we have seen 1,740, wasn't it? Or 80, something like that. That's the record, insanely high numbers. But there has been a general uptick over the last three or four days. Tim White says, regarding the increase in manpower losses, I'm told it's because of a subtle change on the front line. Russia forces troops into many small simultaneous attack groups. Most get wiped out, but each time one sneaks through, the unit follows to move the front line forward a little. It's what we have been hearing over the course of the war, actually, that if they're trying to take a, a, a tree line, they'll send... Like this is what they were doing. They, I don't think they have that many APCs anymore, but that's just my speculation. They'd send like or infantry fighting vehicles. They send three IFVs um, with packed with people in, maybe sixty people. Two two IFVs get blown up. One gets through, unloads, and then of those people, five make it to the tree line. So I'd have like fifty people five make it and then they send another way 50 people five make it another way 50 people five make it and at the end of the end of the day they have 15 people controlling that tree line job done thank you very much but they've lost like 120 people doing it right they that's the way they do it just a few a few a few get through and they're able to uh, sustain those losses so it seems so far there's going to be a point where that becomes truly unsustainable. I think it is unsustainable. People have questioned me what I mean by unsustainable. When you are unable to take those losses without fundamentally changing the way you do things, uh, that is sustainable. So if you can you know, keep on taking those losses and you've got as many well-trained, well-equipped people with loads of materiel and artillery support, doing, you, can, you can do that all day long. But as soon as you start having to send in people who are poorly trained or you're getting mercenaries from abroad or convicts uh, and they have poor equipment and you're not giving them uh, artillery support and they're not being driven up in infantry fighting vehicles but they're mainly doing it on foot then that, that those strategies have been unsustainable those attacks previously are have been unsustainable because you are forced to change the way you're doing things because of attrition okay Right, uh, one example of heavy personnel losses, and I, I showed you this one last night. This is a troop accumulation, one presumes near the sa same river, on the same river up in the Kursk Oblast, where the Russians, as you can see here, actually accumulate quite a number of... Yeah, brilliant. Quite a number of people here. Uh, so good, I, I guess, 30-odd personnel equipment as well, and personnel on the other side as well. It's difficult to know... Uh, how many might have uh, been taken out in this because you've got all those people there and that's pretty much when the cluster munitions strike. So you get, and I, I'm not going to play it, I'm just going to give you, there, there's a sense of cluster round on going across the river. You, you don't get the foot there, that's probably a little bit of a better picture. So those people lined up down there and on the other side of the river and potentially some equipment as well getting hit directly by two cluster rounds, uh, high Mars cluster rounds. So high Mars strikes Russian military personnel and equipment with cluster missiles uh, near one of the pontoon crossings uh, across the same river in Kurs. So that's you know, potentially quite a big loss of Russian uh, personnel there. OSINT Uri here, Uri Kikasi says, Russian sources report that their Su-30SN uh, that was shot down yesterday was hit by manpads fired by a Ukrainian special forces team in boats. 
attempting to cease, seize, um, slightly wrong word, seize the Crimean 2 drilling platform. The Crimean 2 belongs to Ukraine and was captured by the Russians at the time they invaded Crimea. So this claim is that it was special forces with man pads on the shoulder in the boats shooting down that that plane. Um, but anyway, that that's where it took place and that's where the drilling platform is that they were trying to take. Now this is the Zemledeli remote mine laying system uh, next to Russian pontoon crossings over the same river. That gets uh, fully taken out. I can't really show you these videos, but they are linked in the description below. Now, this is another significant video in my humble opinion, because we have an S-400 missile system at Cape Tarkankut, Tarkankut which is, actually we've got the, the map here nice. So that is where we're talking about. There was a special forces raid on there, if you remember, some time back. Uh, they have hit a number of targets here, air defense systems and radars, because that will cover a large area of the sea here in terms of target acquisition and defense. Uh, so that that there, there have often been strikes on that part of Crimea. Uh, there's footage showing Russian soldiers watching as two Neptune missiles. This is why I want to show this one. Neptune missiles flew toward their position. The footage is reportedly taken somewhere around the August 23rd. So it's a couple of weeks back when a launcher and a radar were hit. So interesting that that's two Neptune missiles supposedly uh, hitting there. And we we have heard, we've heard for a long time that Neptune missiles are capable. They've got a really long range, so maybe a thousand kilometers now. But my supposition is that the, the Ukrainians are unable to make them at scale. I think there was one claim that they were making, one a month. That's It's hugely important that they up scale the production of weapons like these these are hugely important when you consider that the americans have been really reluctant to allow russia to fire deep into uh, allow ukraine to fire deep into russia and that can be overcome that issue by using neptune missiles i don't know how resilient they are to uh, to air defenses and electronic warfare etc etc but potentially quite resilient because here they are hitting the very things that that might want to be shooting them down and i there was also i think another video that's out of another neptune strike on some pretty uh, hefty equipment from last year uh, that I've, I've just seen this morning so there's a, a few bits of footage concerning that missile now um, Tim White says a truck is on fire on a highway in Volgograd region. In light of recent sabotage attacks, it's worth taking note of. Reports say the fire started in the wheel and soon spread to engulf the vehicle as well as grassland. So this is one report of that, uh, but that's quite significant fires. I don't. I'm not going to show you too closely. But then the same one of the same bits of footage says fuel trucks ex fuel trucks exploded near the Marinovka air airfield in the Volgograd region. So this might be more than just a truck catching fire, possibly due to sabotage. And now we're talking fuel trucks, multiple trucks exploding near an airfield. So this looks like a, a more of a strike. I don't know uh, what's going on here, uh, as in I don't know who who's correct there. I think one is far more serious than the other. But anyway, potential uh, loss of fuel and logistics capabilities for the Russians and potentially part of an airfield. Who knows? Now, this news came out yesterday. Very sad news. So International Red Cross uh, statement confirms the deaths of three Red Cross staffers in today's attacks, says Chris Miller from the Financial Times, which it says occurred in the village of Vir Virolyubivka, just west of Chaziv Yar. The ICRC doesn't say it explicitly, as is typical of the organization, but that is Ukrainian controlled territory that has been under heavy Russian attack for months. And Vladimir Zelensky also reports says another Russian war crime today the Occupy attacked vehicles of the International Committee of the Red Cross Humanitarian Mission in Donetsk region. As of now, we know of two injured people who are receiving all the necessary assistance. Unfortunately, three people were killed in this Russian strike. My deepest condolences, etc., etc. Um, it's absolutely clear, he says, Russia sows evil, Ukraine defends life. If anyone wants to hear both sides in Russia, it is only perceived as permission to kill again. The world must respond firmly with, and with principle, etc., etc. Right. Uh, well, actually, I'm not just going to go, etc., etc., because this is terrible. Countries and international organizations cannot remain indifferent. Only together can the world force Russia to stop this terror and make Moscow seek peace. Absolutely agree with that. 
and this was a te terrible incident, I wanted to focus on how the ICRC reports it themselves. And the, as mentioned by Christopher Miller, this is in line with how they do things because they want to be seen as neutral so that they can operate um, easily without too much friction on both sides of any given front line. So they are, you'll very rarely see them, if ever, apportion blame. So Glasnost gone here says, well, basically this is ICRC Ukraine, says three of our staff members in Ukraine were killed today after shelling hit the site of. So rather than saying we were in occupied Ukraine and the shelling was coming from the Russian side, it's completely devoid of any information that would allow you to apportion any kind of blame. Three were killed uh, today after shelling hit the site of a planned frontline aid distribution in the Donetsk region and two more colleagues were wounded. Our hearts are broken and we mourn, the, with the, mourn this loss and care for the injured. But it's interesting that Twitter readers have appended a community notes to this to kind of properly report what actually happened. Missing information. Ukrainian ICRC humanitarian aid workers were killed by Russian shelling. Even Russian reports take credit for the killing, reporting the killing that hit ICRC vehicles at a frontline aid distribution in Vrilobivka, uh, Donetsk region, were Russian. So, and, that, and they give loads of links to support those claims. On the one hand, it's really frustrating that the ICRC, that the Red Cross doesn't sort of t take any moral stance here that oh it's you know not that they're blase that it's just what happens in war you know we refuse to say Russians are the bad guys I assume behind the scenes they're absolutely livid and probably think the Russians are a bunch of gits here so on, on the one hand you can argue that's weak of the ICRC but on the other hand actually you can also understand why they have to say this because if they want if they're going to start having a go at Russia right and then they want to get behind occupied uh, behind the front line into occupied territory and start doing needed humanitarian work on that side the Russians are going to be like screw you you guys keep slagging us off for you know killing killing people well yeah uh, so i i guess the ICRC are trying to leave it to others to do the blame game and rightfully so. And they'll probably, behind the scenes, they'll probably be thankful for that. Glasnost gone here says, just to be clear, Russia deliberately killed the three Red Cross staff members today and wounded two others by targeting them while unloading vital humanitarian aid. This is in the village of Vorolyubivka in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region, as men mentioned. So it's difficult. Like On the one hand, you would want the ICRC to be super bloody angry about this and throwing out righteous accusations against the Russians. On the other hand, that is actually counterproductive for the kind of work they do. And that's why they had to be careful. I'm not trying to, because I know they get a lot of hassle like the Red Cross compared to other aid organisations. The claim is that there are loads of Red Cross vehicles unused sitting in these lots and there's lots of money that's gone into Ukraine, but actually it's not translating to actual aid. But here is, you know, the actual work of the Red Cross doing stuff around Chesibyar and being, it seems, purposefully targeted. Right. Uh, Jane Kiev says, not a day goes by without a Russian train derailment. So Intel Schizo, train 2641 arrived on at track 6 at Zlatust station. Uh, locomotive 2E S6579 derailed. Uh, cause of the derailment is unknown. This is, again, uh, what is this, the third train uh, we've seen derailed this in the last week? Uh, this is actually quite serious, I think, and uh, whether it's sabotage or um, partisan activity or, or direct effects of Ukrainian strikes or something like that, I, I can't say, but this is going to be good for Ukraine because the railway network is so important to Russia. Russia is a railway nation, such a huge nation that they transport an awful lot by rail. And uh, if, if this happens, then on, a, on a, as routine basis as it appears to be, then the Russians are going to be in trouble. And there's already been rumours that they're rail network is on its knees and that's coming from leaks from inside the russian rail industry itself okay ukrainian armed forces furthermore attacked the temporarily occupied chernihiv districts that's not chernihiv 
up in the north of Ukraine, but Chernihiv district down in the south in Zaporizhia region, according to local channels. The target was a freight train uh, loaded with fuel tanks. Russian emergency services uh, officials reported that three fuel tanks were completely burned out. Uh, so an, another train issue for the Russians there. Right, moving on to distant strikes. The Ukrainian Air Force reported another Russian drone attack. So another 26 drones launched. There are consistently large numbers of drones being sent into Ukraine every single night. 24 were shot down. Shot down. I don't know about the other two, whether electronic warfare took any out or whether two got through to their targets or whether they did indeed hit their targets etc etc but 24 were intercepted with their defense that's a pretty good ratio uh in occupied mariupol at night a warehouse of the occupiers uh, with ammunition and missiles for air defense was destroyed according to the advisor to the mayor andrea shchenko and you've got that caught uh, largely on uh video lots of audio of explosions and visuals of explosions as well um, explosions occurred last night, says no reports of the same um, same same event in the area of occupied Mariupol. Uh, yeah, air defense missiles detonation lasted until 5 a.m. So that's fairly good news for the Ukrainians if they're having that that length of secondary explosions. There was also uh, there were also strikes on the Russian occupied Luhansk city. I don't know what happened there, but some targeted strikes within that that on Verons. Uh, the Russians on the other hand targeted a church in Nikopol built in 1912 a, a, a beautiful looking uh, building ornate inside uh, all that sort of paintwork damaged uh, it's just a, a real a real shame and having to throw all of that water into the church look at it burning it's an absolute travesty there culturally speaking and this is not unusual we've seen strikes into Odessa doing similar things to huge uh, cultural icons and buildings. We've seen it in Lviv. Wow, look at that. All the roof falling down there. What an absolute disgrace. Um, anyway, yeah, that that's Russia for you. Yeah, we've seen it in Lviv in, in the West too with the UNESCO heritage sites being here. Uh, Russia strikes a cargo ship with the Ukrainian wheat for Egypt in the Black Sea. This is incredibly important. So Russian missiles struck a cargo ship carrying Ukrainian wheat to Egypt through the Black Sea on September the 12th, according to Zelensky, who said the internal stability and life of dozens of countries in different parts of the world depend on the normal and uninterrupted operation of our food, uh, food export corridor. Now, this is going to be huge because this will affect the insurance on these vessels and you might start getting insurers not insuring these vessels or certainly the premiums be going up and we know that the uk has been involved in either underwriting or enforcing uh insurance enforcing insurers to actually insure these vessels where they weren't previously so the uk is a big maritime insurance hotbed so lloyd's of London is a huge maritime insurer, loads of others. That's how oil price cap was um, facilitated. So UK got involved there. They got involved with this grain corridor. And a strike like this might well cause an absolute nightmare for f food exports from Ukraine. Not only does that help Ukraine, but it helps the rest of the world. It helps every country because if you stop being able to export all this food, then you are cutting supply to the global markets, which means wherever you are in the world, the price of food, thank you, Ivan, the price of food will go up. Now that's a direct effect on uh, global inflation wherever you are in the world. You know, even if you don't directly get that grain, that other country will need that grain and they'll be bidding on the on the global market and the prices will go up as as demand stays the same, but supply is cut. Now, while there were no casualties reported, the attack raises concern about the potential impact on global food food security, says the Euromaidan press. Um, so Christopher Miller says, my source with knowledge of this Russian missile attack on a grain ship had left uh, that had left the Ukrainian port yesterday said the attack occurred in Romanian waters. So you've got a lot of things going on here. Like well, You have a strike, uh, it appears like an absolute targeted strike on a non-Ukrainian um, ship. So it looks like it's an Egyptian-owned ship, Turkish Ran, that this is affecting global food supplies 
and it happened in Romanian waters potentially, which is a NATO country. What is going to happen about this? This is absolutely critical. I think this is a hugely important event. And will we see the international community dither? Will we see the international community look for excuses not to react to this? Thomas Tyner says, now watch Erdogan take revenge. Unlike Schultz and Biden, Erdogan knows that Putin will fold instantly if confronted militarily. So this is a Turkish operated merchant vessel. So although it's Egyptian owned, I think it's operated by the Tur Turks here. The MV Aya has been hit by a supersonic anti-ship missile in the Black Sea. The KX-22 missile was launched from a Russian 222M backfire bomber. The ship was carrying 26,550 tons of grain for Egypt. Now, Egypt is kind of in the sphere of influence of Russia, same with Turkey. This is, I, it appears to me a kind of bizarre thing for Russia to do. I mean, this is really high risk. Or they just don't give a damn anymore because they, they either think the international community is toothless or they're testing to see whether they are toothless. John Ridge says in, it's 1968, the KH-22 has entered service as an anti-ship weapon. It's 2024, KH-22 is operationally debuted as an anti-ship weapon. So in other words, this is the first time it's actually hit a ship, according to him at least, in 32, 24, 56. 56 years of existing as an anti-ship missile. It gets its first ship, which is to hit a grain export vessel now as next reports here uh the 222 m3 attack on a civilian vessel could have ended in an environmental disaster instead of a grain ship the russian armed forces could have attacked an oil tanker says defense express analysts found out that at the time of the attack there were eight tankers in the area of the hit of the aya vessel the strike was carried out with a KH-22 missile, but even if, there, if the target was chosen among the bulk carriers, there's no guarantee that the missile would not transfer to a larger tanker. In other words, this is a really high, ri it's really high risk event, um, you know, decision by the Russians here. Could have hit an oil tanker, could have been an environmental disaster in the Black Sea. Absolute shocker from the Russians again. And at, this is at the same time that Starmer is arriving in the US. He, there's been lots of talk. In fact, I went and had a dentist appointment this morning. And they, they were discussing on LBC Storm Shadow missiles. This is like front page news again. Uh, Ukraine is now on the news agenda. And that's good. What they're debating is whether we should allow storm shadows to be fired deep into Russia. And there's still this, oh, should we, oh, ah, is it going to be escalatory? Luckily, the, although the last one I, I heard was, no, we shouldn't, we should be trying to stop the war, blah, 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 all that kind of bollocks. It's like, yeah, but what, do we just let Putin invade countries, sit back and then try and stop the war rather than be able to defend or help someone defend their own sovereign territory? So uh, luckily, a good few people calling into the show that I was listening to uh, indicated that yeah we should allow the storm shadows to be used and we need to put Putin in his place and he's on the red lines he's been silent every time anyway the US and UK may be on the verge of what could be a hugely significant move regarding the war in Ukraine with a report suggesting both countries might soon allow Kiev to use their long-range weapons to strike targets deep in Russian territory however as many news articles say this there are other ones saying they're not actually going to decide anything now there's another one saying that the US might give the UK well that's very kind of you might give the UK permission or Ukraine permission to use UK missiles so we could end up being the full guy now I don't mind that it, 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 I've often argued that you want to get smaller nations to do things before you get the bigger nations. In this case, UK is a smaller nation compared to the US. And you, although we are a bit of a boogeyman for the Russians, they, they love to say it's all our fault for X, Y and Z. We are not the US. And if the US said, right, you can use ATACMs, then that's 
escalatory in a way that UK allowing storm shadows might not be. So you, it's about pushing the envelope. It's why I said before that it should be like the Baltic nations that get in and start training Ukrainian troops in Ukraine, because then it's like Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Estonia. They, it's not like it's not like American trainers. It's not like French trainers. And then you have a few more. You add on a few more. So you start with Estonia and you add on Lit Lithuania and Latvia and then maybe some Polish trainers and then sometime down the down the uh, down the track some British trainers and French and then maybe US after six months. You just push the envelope each time and it's the boiling the um boiling the lobster in a pot type approach. Sorites paradox kind of in uh, in philosophical talk where there's no one moment of absolute escalation. It's so gradual that they can't say, right, that's it, you've done it, now we're going to re respond to that. And I think that should be done now. If you are going to give permission, where well, it shouldn't have been in public, but it should have been gradual, 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 and then and you can say that about distance. So you just let people strike, let the Ukrainians strike 100 kilometres, 120, 140, 160 200, 300 kilometers, and then you do that with storm shadows, and you then allow atacums, and it's this gradual thing uh, that that has no clear demarcation point. Right now, Russia, however, is relocating planes out of atacums range. Now, the claim from the Americans is that only 10% of them are still within that range. Mark Krutov reviewed satellite images of airfields from 2023 to 2024. There's a huge difference. For example, Milorovo Air Base as seen on planet imagery in 2023 and 2024 images, uh, show a huge difference in the number of airframes. Uh, reaching conclusions requires analysing many more photos, he says. Uh, and that's in response to Tatarigami saying back in July um, that Russia was relocating valuable air assets. So definitely happened. Right, the deputy head of the Rosgvardia directorate. So Rosgvardia, like your military police, riot police, that, that actually formed a considerable part of the forces that came into Ukraine. And this is why we we know back in February 2022 that the initial objectives of the Russians were that this was a special military operation. It always was supposed to be just an operation to go in, change the government, clear up, spend two weeks clearing up, stopping riots, which is why you had the riot police. People with parade uniforms only had uh, rations for five days. This is going to be really quick change over the government and the Rosgvardia were a large part of that so a lot of deaths initially in terms of APCs and things that were blown up were Rosgvardia personnel at the beginning of the war anyway that's just who they are deputy head of the Rosgvardia directorate of temporarily for temporarily occupied Crimea and Sevastopol Vitaly Salmanov has been arrested he's accused of exceeding his official powers according to State Duma deputy Alexander Kinstein, Kinstein. Um, more trouble at mill. Trouble at mill, uh, there appears to be within the hierarchy of the Russian armed services. Over 150 miners have been trapped underground in a Donetsk mine. Not for the first time this has happened, although not, not as many as 150 we've seen previously. Due to Russian attacks, 150 miners were trapped at the Dibropilia mine due to blackout caused by Russian attacks on Donetsk Oblast. Um, and uh, Russian strikes have cut off power to Dibropilia and nearby settlements, including coal mines. The blackout caused gassing and flooding of the mines. So that must be pretty scary, and I hope they're all safe and sound and now or on the way to being now a russian serviceman here says that georgian polish and french mercenaries are hanging children in russia in kursk or blast typical russian propaganda it's it's obviously nonsense this is never going to be happening and yet they'll try it on with the international community this will probably find its way to marjorie teddy green and she'll tweet it at some point uh, absolutely ridiculous right Sorry, I had to take a phone call then. Right, okay. Uh, so yeah, propaganda, typical. Uh, okay, moving on to talk about Kursk. Uh, Russian sources admit that the Ukrainians have had success and are in the Russian rear of their counterattack. The likely goal is Glushkoko itself. Ukrainians are in Vesaloya in Kursk. Now, I talked about this last night. Go and check my uh, my discussion about Kursk last night. 
there is the Kursk, uh, just to the right of this, this map, is the Kursk salient. The Russians are attacking from their territory here to the, to the right, if you like, and the Ukrainians are trying to come up from the border to the south. Uh, and sort of cut them off or m give them distractions or, or whatever. So that's what that is talking to. Now, Carl, who is, I think, a guy involved with Estonian intelligence, that Michael Weiss often does a thread of, uh, a new, here he says, a new Carl analysis on the latest in Ukraine. So Carl is not, won't be his real name. So this is Carl, take it for what it is. It's a bit of an unknown person, but he's, he always has, I've shared these with you before, always has pretty interesting um, analysis. So in Kursk, the Ukrainian offensive developed further since the last time we spoke, and in total, Ukraine managed to conquer as much territory as Russia had conquered in eastern Ukraine since the beginning of the year. This was done in the first two weeks of the operation. Now there is talk of a possible Russian counterattack, which has already happened. So, but anyway, this will be a couple of days out of date. It remains to be seen how strong it will be, but it will certainly come. My guess is that resources that Russia currently has in the region will not be enough to kick Ukraine entirely out of the area. It will probably be enough to prevent Ukraine from further insignificant advances, though. It is unclear how much Russia has already counterattacked, if anything. Hard to speak of the potential success or scale of the Russian counterattack. Russia is attempting to prevent Ukraine from gaining control of the area around Klushkoko between the same river and the border. So this is this is the area we're just talking about. Ukraine has not tried to take the area in full force. This could be a trap. So I've been wondering about this. You've got that bridge. They blew up the three sorry, that river, same river, they blew up the three bridges, permanent bridges, and then a load of pontoon bridges, which kept this kind of area, it was blocked in by the river, and then one side, so as you're looking at me, this side will be the Ukrainian border, actually comes up this side, goes down, and you've got the river up there as well, and then the river across here, the top of the rectangle, if you like, bottom of the rectangle is the Ukrainian border, and this side of the rectangle is is the Kursk offensive area that the Ukrainians can control. So the Ukrainians control three sides of the rectangle and the river on top blocks people from getting out, the Russian soldiers from getting out and back into Russian controlled area. So what the Russians have done is attacked the edge of this Kursk area where the Ukrainians have taken control and they've kind of come under the same river and are attacking there. And the Ukrainians are coming up. They didn't take this previously. So I was always talking about how they, I'm sure they're going to take this. This is a perfect area to take. Blown up the bridges, but they didn't take it. And then the Russians have gone in to do, to attack over here. So the idea is, is that a trap? Did they not take it to, to goad the Russians in and then cut them off, come up behind them? So they appear to be coming up behind them at the moment. It might not be as, as big and as clever as that. It might just be a smaller attack up here and they're not really trying to, to completely surround them or whatever. So Russia is attempting to... This could be a trap for the Russians. It is difficult to establish a good logistical link to it. Whether Ukraine will use this area to, keep, to trap Russia and destroy their forces will become clear in the next few weeks. Preliminary assessment of, Kur, of the Kursk operational success. Ukraine has become under less pressure from several directions. Russia has had to withdraw units from both the Kharkiv and southern fronts in preparation for the Kursk counter operation, possibly also from the direction of Chesiv Yar. If affected, the cross direction the least, as it has been the most successful for the Russians. I have told you that over the last few weeks. Plus, it is an unpleasant situation for Russia. Emotionally and domestically, more than 100,000 people have been forced to evacuate inside their own country. In a way, this shows how weak Russia is overall. It does not have much of a reserve in the region at the moment. The Kharkiv direction has mixed success for either side. There doesn't seem to be anything overly dangerous for Ukraine at the moment. The same can be said for Kupiansk and Liman. Frontline is quite stable there with no significant movements. In the direction of Chaziv Yar, Ukraine has managed to relieve the pressure but it is not over. Russia has now been trying to advance from the south. There was a claim that they got across the channel, but it seems they have been pushed out again. All in all, the front line hasn't practically moved during the summer. In New York, Russia has been partially pushed out again, at least uh, at least part of the city is back in Ukrainian hands. It goes back and forth. The most uncomfortable situation in Prokrosk um, was a couple of weeks ago, and the pace of the Russian advance was faster than ever. Now it seems that Russia's rapid pace of progress has come to an end. Ukraine, in turn, has brought the reserves in there. This is one of the reasons why the front line is stabilized. Vukhodar direction in the south of Prokrosk is even more dangerous. With Russian having moved further from the east, Vukhodar is in the corner where the north south front turns to east west, west east front. If Russia Russia can advance north of Vukhodar, Ukraine will have a 
to fight an opponent from two directions. It is not yet dram dra dramatically dangerous for Ukraine. It's worth remembering that Vukhodar has been a multiple times graveyard for Russia. It has ended on several occasions with very heavy casualties and no practical progress for them. Uh, it is, in the south, it is quiet. At some stage, Russia has serious fears Kursk was a decoy and the main Ukrainian attack would come in the south. I don't think Ukraine would have that much in reserve. I totally agree. There are also very strong defence lines on both sides of the front. Politically, the manoeuvring continues to get the US restrictions lifted or at least reduced. For the moment, it can be said that things are moving in that direction. The Brits have leaked to The Guardian today, that was yesterday, that restrictions on storm shadows have been lifted and the US has approved it. There is talk that the same will happen with US weapons very soon but Bloomberg reported today that US is reluctant to do so until after the UN General Assembly. This is in this is the next hurdle the US admin has to come up with for itself. They don't want to show world leaders that they are helping escalation. The concessions that are coming are a combination of several things. One is turned into a sensitive issue domestically for Biden's administration as Republicans other than Trump have pushed hard to lift the restrictions. Iranian missiles, two, Iranian missiles getting into Russian hands. Three, intensified Russian attacks on Ukrainian civilian targets. Uh, there are solid claims of Iranian missiles arriving in Russia. They're probably not yet used in combat. Uh, Russia has been trying to spin that they would be ready uh, to negotiate, but with Ukraine invading Kursk, they can't. I'm sure that until the US elections are over and it is clear who won and what the politics will be, Russia won't be ready for any serious negotiations. As long, long as there's a chance for Russia, uh, that Western aid will decrease. They're not interested in negotiations. Regarding the Trump-Harris debate, there was nothing very surprising. Harris rhetorically repeated the current administration's views that in any case support must continue. Uh, Trump gave extremely eclectic and unclear answers. Ukrainians' drone capabilities are steadily improving in terms of range, strike and air defence penetration capabilities. There are days when Ukraine has attacked Russia with higher numbers of drones and vice, than vice versa. I'm not sure that the drone attacks against Olenya airfield were made from Ukrainian territory. Interesting, so there were claims that some drones were coming from, uh, from Norway. Ukraine has said uh, about 1,800 kilometer range, but Alenia is further away, though Ukraine does not have to tell us the whole truth of their drone capabilities. Alenia hosts the Russian strategic bombers that carry out ballistic missiles attacks against Ukraine. Ukraine's ability to counter Russian drones with electronic warfare assets has improved significantly. Lately, 20 to 25 percent of Russian drones have been taken out not by air defense, but by electronic warfare. In this regard, there have been more cases of drones going into the territory of either the occupied Donbass, Russia itself, or Belarus. Belarus allegedly shot one Russian drone down. The drone that crossed into Latvia was due to the same process, I think. It passed through Belarus and crashed in Latvia. I don't think Russia would have deliberately tested Latvia, but it is more complicated when it comes to Poland and Romania. Russia has clearly been using Polish and Romanian airspaces to direct their drones uh, there uh, and then bring them into Ukrainian territory. This is problematic in terms of Polish and Romanian sovereignty. Indirectly, they allow the use of the territory to attack Ukraine. Poland has clearly said on several occasions that their NATO allies have advised them to avoid shooting Russian drones down. It's not hard to guess who that ally is. There are four main things to follow in the next weeks or months. One, whether a Russia pressure on Prokrosk and Vukhodar remains the same. Two, how long it and how difficult it would be for Russia to liberate Kursk. Three, increase in Ukraine's capabilities in Russian direction and whether the US will eventually lift or significantly reduce restrictions. Four, whether Russia will go for some kind of partial mobilization during autumn or winter. According to estimates, Russia could offset their casualties by volunteer recruitment until this spring. Now it has changed so much that all losses can no longer be comp compensated by recruitment. Russia has had to substantially increase the one-off signing fees, uh, signing on fees paid to recruits. How much would lifting US restrictions help Ukraine? It is one of the combination of things that help. Another to, uh, is how to deploy the F-16s. They haven't been massively used so far, probably due to one plane going down. Ukraine's mobilization has improved. Additional reserves have emerged. Ukraine can get respectable units together, although their motivation is not what it was at the beginning of the war. People don't rush to sign up. They take it as just a need to go. It's the same in Russia. Really interesting thread there. Sorry to take so long discussing that or, or reading that to you, but I think it's important. Right, Tim White said, we shouldn't lead to conclusions. Any sudden death has to be investigated. And this is concerning David Knowles from Ukraine, the latest podcast from the Daily Telegraph, who died in Gibraltar suddenly of a cardiac arrest, which is odd for someone who is 32. Although not unheard of, you've got football players that suddenly drop down. Um, it happened to the Tottenham Hotspur player, uh, begins with M, I can't remember his name, and Christian Eriksen as well for while well, he's playing for Denmark, I believe. 
Uh, David's family and friends don't need more stress. Let's just pay tributes to a very good man, good at his job and much loved uh, by subscribers and followers. Let the police do their job. So the police are there, but also they've called in, the, so the Royal Gibraltar Police are there. They've called in, I think, experts from the UK as well, uh, terror experts too. So it's just a precaution. No, I don't think they, they've seen any evidence to suggest anything untoward. But there are lots of people saying this is rather dodgy, looks like it could be Russia. And so I think it's kind of like, just in case, let's make sure we cross all the T's and dot the I's. Elon Musk uh, is still retweeting. Elon Musk has gone off on one. I should never reply to Elon Musk tweets because now I get my threads are just infested with far right, uh, horrible stuff. And it's just interesting that he that that's what that's triggered. Anyway, Elon Musk is retweeting loads of stuff from Benny Johnson, who is one of the people that was on the indictment, the DOJ uh, indictment, as, as receiving money from Tenet Media. And yet Elon Musk is just so deep in that information space that he, in that ecosystem, that he's willfully spreading pro-Russian propaganda still. Uh, there are, he's getting all uppity Elon Musk because there are, moves to in australia to fine um social media sites for spreading allowing disinformation to spread there's also some other moves in the uk uh, there's uh, something else to do with uh, social media as well uh, coming up i'll discuss this at another time but there, there are sort of government regulation looking like it's taking place now i agree with this right disinformation is is the scourge of of reality um and I, I analogize it to this. If you were in charge of a, of a, like a shopping mall, right? And there were loads and loads of crimes taking place. This is like Telegram. Loads and loads of crimes taking, taking place in your shopping mall, right? In your precinct. And um, the, the police came to you and said, right, we need you to do X, Y, and Z to stop that from happening, and you refuse to do X, Y, and Z, then you are facilitating crimes taking place. And you are facilitating harm taking place to the people who are existing there and arguably existing out there. So people get harmed in there, but they're relatives of people out there, etc., etc. So this is a harm to society. Now, if you are not allowing the police to look at your CCTV footage, if you are basically not doing anything the police ask you to do in order to try and and you know you do your civ civic obligations to minimize harm to society taking place on your premises then actually we're going the police are going to start saying right you are now not doing your duty to society we are going to start coming down heavy on heavily on you we're either going to you know, regulate you or fine you or, or, or something because if you're not working with us to minimize the crimes that take there are people getting mugged are people getting um stabbed etc etc on your premises and you are doing absolutely nothing to stop that and in fact you are facilitating it you are amplifying it you are glorifying this in some way so not only are you not stopping it you're actually making it worse then something needs to happen to you and that's a kind of analogy i see with these social media platforms is if they are like if if elon musk has, has sacked all his moderators and he's amplifying disinformation then you're not only are you not doing anything about trying to curtail disinformation, but you're actually making it far worse. And that is directly harming the people that use the platform and society at large, who are then going to be voting on the basis of being thoroughly disinformed. Um, just uh, absolutely incredible. For example, I had an argument with someone yesterday, someone that used to write with me. I did some guest articles on, on my site some years back. He used to be a really good critical thinker and he's gone down the whole... Jordan Peterson, Douglas Murray, right down into the into the depths of like overt racism now. And everything he writes about is, you know, demonizing black people and et cetera, et cetera. But he's also anti-Ukraine aid. And yesterday he he just came back at me like, I'm so tired of the US spending a hun hundreds of billions of dollars more than than Europe. Europe needs to pay for this. I'm like, you've just you've just listened to that off Donald Trump. Donald Trump said that, and this is a dangerous a danger of disinformation. You've got a president who said a lie in public on in a debate, and that has been regurgitated to me, and I'm something of an expert on this, certainly compared to him. And I'm like, okay, here's a freaking chart. 
This is the EU. It's $100 billion more of, of expenditure from the EU than the US. And he actually came back and said, apologies, I must have had old figures. Like, no, you're just, you're just repeating Trump. And he, it's a lie. And this is damaging. You are then going to vote on, on the basis of all this disinformation you have. And you're going to vote in a way that, and you are spreading disinformation in a way that harms Ukraine directly. So something needs to be done about this. And, and it's interesting that, that Australia are looking at fining uh, social media companies who do not do enough about disinformation. And I think that's really important. Um, talk about disinformation. Apti Alaudanov, uh, head of the Akhmat forces, says, quote, Russia fully provides prisoners of war with food and everything they need. And they receive full medical care. Looks like full medical care to me, doesn't it? Everything they need, these guys. Everything they need. Anyway, uh, that's enough for me. Take care, guys. Speak soon.